Welcome to the episode of Jay Lennon's Garage, a featured car today, my 1971 Mercedes-Benz uh, 280 SE 3.5 Coupe. Uh, I love this era of Mercedes-Benz, especially these coupes and convertibles. The coupe more than convertible, actually, for me, because these are the last of the truly coach-built Mercedes-Benz. Uh, these are basically hand-built cars. If you go back and you check the restoration blog for 2016 and 2015, you'll see this car all apart. Uh, and you'll see that all this chrome, it's beautiful brass that's been re -chromed. You know, so many cars use, you know, plastic that's chrome plated or some kind of aluminum here. I mean, these are truly coach built cars. They just, they just shut with such authority. They're so well made. And this was uh, the top of the line, the 3.5. They built uh, a number of these in the 60s uh, with the um, six-cylinder Mercedes-Benz engine. But this engine they built as the uh, engine of the future. It's a 3.5 overhead cam uh, engine, two valves per cylinder, top speed about just about 130 miles an hour. This is a real Autobahn cruiser. This was meant to compete, I think, with the Corniche uh, from Rolls-Royce. It was less money than the Corniche, but I think uh, a better car. Um, Mercedes always had trouble in the 60s in America because they didn't have a V8. Americans like big V8s, Cadillacs, Lincoln. And Mercedes always had six cylinders. And with the accession of the Mercedes 600, which is also a hand-built car, uh, there was no V8 uh, until they came out with the uh, 6.3. Then they started to catch up. I remember when I worked for Mercedes-Benz dealer in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, their newspaper ads used to say, why would anyone pay $10,000 for a four-door sedan? And then they would explain why, because $10,000 is a lot of money. Cadillac was six or $7,000 at the time. This, when it came out, was between twelve dollars and $14,000, and the convertible just a little bit more. So they were very expensive, but I think worth it. The texture of the leather that you got back in this era. You know, modern leather to me has this kind of weird half vinyl feel to it. You know, this is the kind of leather you rub that hide food in. It gives you that rich kind of aroma. Has the beautiful wood. Uh, as I mentioned in the restoration blog, a company named uh, Madeira Concepts redid all the wood for us. Uh, I found this car in Las Vegas. Um, it was pretty worn out, but because it's Vegas and it's dry and the heat, uh, although all the rubber was gone, the wood was all buckled and everything from the heat, the body structure was sound. It didn't appear to have been damaged in any accidents or anything like that. It might have had a few dings, but we straightened those out. Chassis was straight, engine was straight. Uh, we didn't take the drivetrain out. Uh, we had a stuck valve. We worked on the engine in the car because once you take it out, eh, there's just a myriad of problems that can happen. Um, you know, the drivetrain, everything was solid, so that was okay. Redid the leather, redid the paint, uh, every part of it. Well, here, here are some pictures, as you can see. The car was totally stripped down. Uh, there's the wood all out of the dash. The only thing we did differently, we replaced the Mercedes um, air conditioning compressor, which I think was made by Bayer with a uh, vintage air compressor. You know, that's the company out of Arizona that we have all our uh, cars converted to vintage air because they, they're adaptable to almost any vehicle and they're small and they're compact. So when you look at the dashboard here, there are two knobs, one to turn on the compressor, you know, with the fan speed and all that, and the other one, how much cold air do you want? And I priced out the knobs and they were like, $450 a piece for the knobs from Germany. I'm not going to do that. So we 3D printed one. And then the other one, because we used the vintage air part, we used their controller. But other than that, everything else appears to be uh, totally stock. They're just wonderful driving cars. Um, let me, uh, let's open the hood and show you what it's like under there. Now we repainted this car the exact same uh, color. It left the factory, this Mercedes Silver. I can't remember the name of it, but... And all we did under the hood really was clean it up. Uh, we had a stuck valve on this side. 
we fixed that, obviously changed the oil and did all that, of course. Um, re replaced the compressor, uh, flushed out the radiator. But other than that, it's basically, uh, as it left the factory, more of a modern battery rather than a German battery. Um, those are just way too expensive, and these interstates really do a good job. But it cleaned up nicely. Uh, Four-speed transmission, and I always love these stacked headlights more than turned the other way. Uh, you know, I think Paul Brock, I think that's how you say the guy's name. I, it's, you know, there's so many of these German designers, I read the names and I admire their work, but I've never heard their name pronounced, and I pronounce it one way in my head, and then I meet somebody, I go, oh, I had it all wrong. So, uh, I think it's Paul Brock. I think he was uh, the, the head guy at Mercedes at this period. I, I just like this era of Mercedes-Benz, especially the 6.3 four-door sedan. You've seen that one. We've had that on the show. The 600. And now this one sort of kind of makes it the, uh, the three favorite Mercedes-Benz. Because when I worked for Mercedes, or at the car dealership, from uh, 69 to maybe 73, something like that. And I got to drive all of these. And I never thought I would be able to own one of these cars because they're just so nice driving, so plush. And the Mercedes Classic Center, every single part for this car is available from Mercedes. Uh, the parts are expensive, but they're the actual Mercedes part. Uh, one of the most expensive pieces we had to replace was, I call it the compensator for the rear suspension. Uh, they don't make them anymore. You can't get them, but you can exchange them through Mercedes-Benz. Mercedes-Benz hunts the world over to find used ones. They rebuild them. You give them your old core, they give you a new one. And now the car sits and drives nice and levels out nicely. This is a sunroof coupe, which I really like because you have that big, giant sunroof. Um, no Bluetooth, so you don't get annoying phone calls while you're driving. It's fantastic, fantastic. And of course, it has the uh, classic German radio. That's the uh, Becker uh, German radio. Black Punk and Becker were the two uh, radios that came in these. But as you can see, it's just very solid. All this rubber trim, this came from Mercedes-Benz. You know, you can go to these places that'll sell you some rubber they tell you will fit, but it won't. You've got to get it from Mercedes-Benz. If you're going to do it right, you know, you're, you're rebuilding an expensive car, spend the money and get the, the proper parts. Even a new windshield. Because it was Las Vegas, the original windshield was just pitted. It looked like somebody had been firing BBs at it, you know, just sitting out there in the sand. Uh, but Las Vegas, Arizona, New Mexico, those are good places to find these kind of cars because even though they might be worn out structurally, they're sound. And that's what uh, this one is. Come on, let me show you the interior. Come around this side. As you can see, plenty of leg room. Just big, comfortable, overstuffed chairs. That's that knob I was talking about. It's the only thing we changed from stock. We made this on our 3D printer. Um, you've got electric windows here. You've got the uh, Becker Europa stereo. I love these radios. I just hit the button. I don't have to slide things or do any nonsense like you do. Um, tachometer, obviously. And you've got your standard gauges, gasoline, water temperature, oil pressure, um, rear defroster and your four-way flashers. Um, just the quality of the chrome. Um, I love the fact that the glove box is a solid piece of wood. You know, it's not a veneer stuck on plastic. It's a solid piece of wood, which is really pretty cool. And it closes it with a thud. These have a great road feel to them. You know, they haven't been, uh, what's the word I want? Uh, you know, modern cars are so antiseptic and so smooth, whereas this thing, you, you feel what the engine's doing all the time. So I like the transmission. It shifts, shifts crisply and sharp, and there's a little bit of a kick when it shifts, which I like. Um, some of the guys are talking about the door jams. Look at the door jams on this car. It's, it's unbelievable. It's all chrome and a heavy, thick chrome, which is uh, <laughs> very expensive to uh, duplicate. But something that's kind of funny, I want to show you the trunk. Show you how trunks have changed in the last few years. And you got dual exhaust of cars, but the trunk is interesting to me because it shows you 
it's pretty much just one metal stamping. You know, modern trunks, is, it's all padded and insulated and all this kind of stuff. But this is just, just a piece of metal. But look how big it is. And an actual spare tire with a jack. You know, that's the cool thing about these. You know, I've got a Tesla, and twice I've gotten flat tires because of potholes. And there's no spare. You pull off the side of the road, you call a flatbed. Maybe Thursday somebody shows up. And, and you're stuck. Where's this thing? Look, just take a jack. 20 minutes, you're back on the road again. Obviously, we put all new rubber around here, but it's just kind of how pretty much basic this is. It's just one stamping here. You know, now this would be, have all kinds of lights and all sorts of things in it now. But other than that, and we put all new rubber in, so you've really got to like, slam it to get it to, to, uh, to shut. But uh, it's just a fantastic car to drive. Come on, let's take it out on the road and we'll show you, show you what she does. I love the high roof on this thing, you know? I like how spacious it is inside. The greenhouse is fantastic. The car's only got 82,000 miles on it. That's why we didn't feel we needed to pull the engine out and totally redo it. Just cleaned up the top end a little bit, stuck valve, and sitting for a while. That's all it needed. And these motors will run. God. Well, I've got my 6.3 Mercedes. That has 324,000 miles on it. And so that uh, gives us some idea of the longevity of these things. I love the fact that it's real wood, so you can use furniture polish on it to clean it up. I love the fact that it's real leather, and you can use hide food, you know. So many of these things are these artificial look-alike fabrics that don't breathe like leather or even feel like leather. See, it's a strange thing. I don't know whether I love these cars so much because I used to work on them and maintain them and polish them and clean them up for customers, uh, for people I thought I could never afford to live like, or the fact that I just really like them. It's probably a little bit of both. There's a psychological effect to it, you know? I just like the stacked headlights. It looks more uh, substantial to me. And I've always been a big fan of this Mercedes steering wheel. I, I just like the... It really harkens back to the Gullwing, and this is, well, the Gullwing's not much, what's that, about 16 years earlier than this, so you can see the relationship. It just smells better, you know, this rich leather, and of course the giant sunroof, which is fantastic. When I got this car, it had white wall tires on it, and uh, Michelin used to make a white wall radial back in the day in a 14 inch. This one had some kind of Bridgestone or aftermarket tires. Mercedes should always have Michelin. And that's what I put on here. I couldn't find the white walls. The white walls look nice and look period correct. But if the choice of having something other than Michelin to get a white wall, I'll stick with the black wall tire. I just think the Michelin suits the car better, rides better, handles better. I get a little bit more road feel. I mean, this thing is just a great highway cruiser. You know, 65, 70, it's barely working. And these would run 130 miles an hour when American cars would top out at, you know, 106, 105. This thing will run 130 miles an hour all day long. Let me cut in front of this lesser Mercedes. See, that model does nothing for me doesn't have the presence of this car. When you drive this car, people come out and they go, what is that? Why is that Mercedes? Why, what year is that, you know? And it's sort of a timeless style, I think. Even though it's just about 50 years old, it still looks reasonably contemporary. And a 3.5 V8, that's tiny by American standards, good heavens. This might have been a good size engine by European standards, 3.5 liter, but by American standards, it was pretty tiny. I mean, 3.5 liter is only about, what, 213 cubic inches? That's not smaller than the 265 Chevy V8 or, you know, 260 Ford or any of those cars. Uh, in fact, it's smaller than the 215 cubic inch Buick. So, tiny by American standards, but makes a lot of torque, a lot of power. 
and a really, really good motor. It was expanded over the years to 4.5 liter, and uh, you know, in increments after that. I just love the way these handle. Obviously, they don't handle as well as a modern Mercedes Benz with, you know, the sophisticated suspension and whatnot. But it's it's just still a remarkable car. And when you put your foot in it, it kicks down. You know, but a vehicle like this, it's really about how it makes you feel when you're driving it. You know, it's a bit like the difference between just get an electronic watch and then a beautiful watch that you enjoy winding the mainspring main every night before you go to bed, you know, those solid clicks. That's what this feels like to me. It feels like the solid click of a, you know, a handmade watch. It's just, just a remarkable automobile. They really are. As you can see, all kinds of room in this thing. As I mentioned before, I have a horn ring right here, uh, tachometer, gas, um, oil pressure, water temperature, then some idiot light like there for emergency brake and other things. There's your speedometer right here, 100 mile, 160 mile hour speedometer, somewhat optimistic. One of my favorite things is this here. It's a big giant sunroof. Take a look how big it is. Nothing like driving one of these on a cool California night. You know, you got the, the heat on in here and just enough cold air swirling around. Especially when you're going along the coast. It's just great. And the nice thing is it seals up. You know, most modern sunroof cars, the roof is lower. And it's kind of hits your head if you want the sunroof. Whereas this thing, there's so much space in here. And this wood gives it a real quality finish. You got your uh, Becker Europa radio. These were really expensive back in the day, but really good radios. I'd turn it on for you, but then we'd have to pay uh, royalties if there's some song playing. I, I, I don't get it. This was sort of the first time, well, not the first time, but Mercedes-Benz had just started to integrate air conditioning into their cars. You know, German cars really didn't have air conditioning back in the 60s and 70s because it's Germany, you know. Summer lasts for like two Thursdays, you know. But then as more and more cars got sold to the American market, it began being integrated into it. But it works quite well. The only disadvantage, the only vent you have are right here. You know, there's no vents on the side or anywhere else. You know, modern cars, air conditioning, pump it through the roof and every other place. And there's nothing quite as prominent as that three-pointed star on the hood when you're going down the road. I really enjoy that. Even the clock works on this one. I hate when I get into a car and a clock doesn't work and I go, Come on, what are you doing? So if the clock doesn't work, what else doesn't work? But this is a car you could cross continents in like that, you know. You could drive this from England all the way to the south of Spain and uh, never want to get out of it. We've got the seats all the way back, but as you can see, there's, uh, there's room for four in this car. Might be a little cramped back there, but Hey, I'm not sitting back there, what do I care? And as I mentioned before, the solid wood glove compartment, which I like, and that manual, you always got like four of these books in there, and they're really kind of cool, because they tell you how to do everything. You know, modern manuals don't really tell you anything, they just tell you uh, to not sue the company. Whereas that tells you how to change tires, oil filters, all kinds of things. The nice thing about this is, this was a one-owner car, and, uh, I always liked that. Uh, it got a bit neglected near the end of its life. I think the gentleman got elderly. But uh, it was well maintained. You know, they only built about something like 3,200 of these coupes worldwide, which isn't very many, but it's amazing how many survive. People just seem to take care of them and cherish them as uh, I do this one. I hope you like this little bit of uh, German nostalgia here because to me this is uh, such a thrill to be able, finally be able to get one of these and, and get it back in the kind of shape they were in when, uh, well, when I had to wash and polish them the first time. I'll uh, see you guys next week. Bye-bye.